Well, good morning. Welcome to Valley View Chapel. Hey, children, thanks for being with us so far. If you're in, uh, if you're zero through fifth grade, uh, you can walk down. Well, I guess the zero-year-olds can't walk down, but children, you're dismissed now with, uh, for Powerhouse. Thanks for being with us. And thanks, parents, for entrusting your children to ministries at Valley View Chapel. Uh, we love children, and we're so glad that you're here. Hey, go back in time with me. Um, what is it, I guess, about five years ago, October 29th, 2012, Superstorm Sandy hit the Northeast and hit hard. We all probably have our own Sandy storms, right? Maybe you were without power for a long time, a week perhaps. Uh, there were millions without power in this area. Storm caused $62 billion in damage, uh, claimed over 30 lives. We were ravaged by the storm, and afterwards we were used to hearing um, just tales of, uh, of calamity and, uh, and just depressing stories. But a few stories emerged that gave us a little hope or maybe just made us smile. One such story um, came out of Maniloking, New Jersey. Ed Wright's home in Maniloking, New Jersey, you could see it there on the, the, uh, that side, <laughs> um, suffered minimal damage in the storm while every house within 200 feet of his was leveled. In all, about 60 homes in his community of Ocean County were destroyed. Wright, a retired industrial arts teacher who taught high school students um, design and architecture, designed his own home, and he had it built on 34 pilings that drove down deep into concrete as a foundation. The first floor itself was eight feet above ground level. One local worker said in an understatement about Wright's home, the house was designed differently than others in town. He was a trendsetter or a fortune teller. Ed Wright knew the ocean outside his front door was powerful, a force to be reckoned with. He knew a storm would come, so he built his home not just to enjoy the sunny days, but the stormy ones as well. Like Ed, whether you know it or not, you and I are builders. We're builders not of buildings necessarily, but of our lives. We have the freedom to build our lives on anything we want. Of course, some belief systems, some activities and foundations, you could call them, will ruin us. They might be pleasant for five minutes, but for five years or 50 years, they cause damage and they undermine our whole life. But we're builders, building our lives one decision, one thought, one action, one move at a time. So let me ask you, how's the building project of your life going? these days. If yours is a little like mine, I'd wonder if you feel the need for some renovating here and there. Maybe a little demolition here, or maybe an addition there, maybe a complete overhaul. Maybe you need to tear it down to the studs or even more just down to the foundation. Wipe the whole slate clean and start over. You're a builder of your life. How's it going? I'd invite you to hear one of the stories Jesus told about two builders. Well, actually, it was more of a story of the foundations of the buildings these builders built. So listen in on this story that Jesus told about the foundations. Matthew 7, 24 and following. We read it earlier. I want to read it again. Anyone who listens to my teaching, Jesus says, and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Why did Jesus tell this story? That's what I ask myself as I read Scripture. I hope you ask yourself questions like that. Why did Jesus tell this story? Why, why this story, this parable, and why now? Well, he had just finished teaching about the lifestyle that God desires, the types of decisions that honor him, the ways we should live in relation to others. And what Jesus said here, called the Sermon on the Mount, consequently because it was a sermon he gave on the mountain, um, it, this was a different type of teaching than the people were used to hearing. They were used to religious teaching. The people that Jesus was with were very religious people. They knew lots of religious rules. They may not have kept them, but they knew them. There were plenty of smug religious teachers who felt it was their duty to tell the people what God expected of them. And they told them lots of things because they said God expected a lot of things. 
in their estimation, most people weren't doing so well in pleasing God's expectations. Pretty much their little group of religious people, religious leaders, were the only ones pleasing God those days. They were the cool kids who ruled the religious playground of the first century of Judaism. These religious leaders from various camps uh, came from all over, but they were predominantly the Pharisees and the scribes. These were groups of people that, that uh, codified laws and taught them and practiced them very smugly and self-righteously. They demonstrated to others what they thought righteousness looked like. So Jesus came on the scene to a nation imprisoned by rules, but it really wasn't God's rule book anymore. No, the leaders had added their own ideas that didn't just separate people from God, they separated people from people. There were the religious elites and the sinners. So Jesus was grabbing their attention by laying a new foundation down, a new standard by which all could measure their lives, a common ground to come back to that aligned with the designs of God and not people. It actually wasn't new, though, since God had drawn these lines in the sand before. Maybe you've heard of Moses or Ten Commandments or uh, the Old Testament. See, God had all along been telling His people what He desired, but they took it superficially. They worked above the surface of their lives, uh, if they even did that. And they missed the foundation that he was. So Jesus is is extending the reach of God's design and God's law to go beyond the surface to the foundation, to life transformation. And that's why I think he picks this illustration of builders and foundations. It's a fitting one. Jesus said another time, look, it's out of the overflow of your heart. It's out of your foundation that your life is lived, that your words come. So Jesus is coming back to that heart, to God's desire and design God's reign of interest from what had become just superficial obedience to life transformation as he meant it. So, Jesus calls his hearers' attention and ours as well to their foundations. Now, some of the Jewish law teachers back then uh, got in an argument. Which is more important, hearing God's law or doing God's law? And they resolved that it was hearing the law since you couldn't obey it if you didn't hear it. But in, in stressing the hearing of it, they undermined the obedience of God's law. And maybe the context that day, maybe that season when Jesus told this story, maybe it was autumn. Now, in Palestine, in the summer, summers were dry and arid, uh, but then autumn and winter brought heavy rains so that floods would gush through these ravines that had been dried during the summer. So it was conceivable, if you didn't know otherwise, if you're new to the area, um, if we were to teleport back in time, it was conceivable that you could build your house in a place that looks fine. But then once the rains came, they would wash it away. You had built in a a flood plain. Everyone knew foundations were critical to longevity and to the strength of a building. Early Palestinian foundations were deep trenches that they would dig and then fill with stone and lime, kind of like makeshift concrete. Some of them went 30 feet down. Archaeologists have discovered ruins of houses that went 30 feet down to the bedrock in their foundation. They would build it up with a stone and lime. In fact, it was common practice to inscribe on a foundation the purpose for that building or a dedication of that building. So foundations were, were everybody knew how important they were. And everybody knew how, how soft sand is, how it makes a terrible foundation. It's, it's easy to erode and to wash away with the autumn and the, the winter rains. Sand is shifty, it's vulnerable, it makes a terrible foundation. Uh, during, in 2003, when Hurricane Isabel hit North Carolina, five feet of beachhead was lost and a hundred feet of shoreline was pulled back into the ocean, uh, or five feet of elevation and a hundred feet uh, width was, was pulled back into the ocean. Sand is a terrible foundation. So Jesus is saying, when storms are big enough, buildings do get washed away. They had probably seen this. What doesn't get washed away is a good, strong foundation. It's out of view. Others can't see it, but it's firm and secure. So Jesus says, if you listen to my words, that's your strong foundation. And you're wise if you do. If you just, not just listen, but if you do those words, you're wise. What did he mean by wise? Well, well, wise, you know, it meant uh, sensible, intelligent, prudent. It, it had this, the picture of, of having a strong inside that led to a strong outside, almost like one's diaphragm. When we breathe, our diaphragm is powering the breath that that fuels our actions and our movements. A strong diaphragm means you can have strong movements. On the other hand, Jesus used a word for fool. The word was maros. Maros. What does that sound like? 
moron. <laughs> you can be wise or you can be a moron. You can act brainless, totally dumb, out to lunch. That's what Jesus was saying. You can be a fool or you can be wise. Which will it be? Why, why though, why would they be foolish? Why would they be morons if they didn't build their life on Jesus' words, if they didn't listen and do? Because like a bad builder, they knew the potential of disaster. See, if your Bibles are open to Matthew 7, just go back a little bit to Matthew 5, for instance. Look at what Jesus said about things like murder. Matthew 5, 22. He said, murder starts with hatred. So hatred is something you need to avoid. I mean, that's good advice, right? How many shootings will happen before we realize murder starts with hatred? I guess Jesus is right. To hear his words and ignore them is to open up your life to ruin. Or another thing he says about adultery, just a little bit after that, 528. He says, before you actually break your marriage promise with another person's body, you break that promise in your mind. You know as well as I that scandals, affairs, shady relationships, they don't happen first in a hotel room or on some business trip. They happen long before in the privacy of your mind. So before your body sinks to the acts of lust, your mind has already gouged holes in the bow of your life and you're taken on water, sinking fast. And then later on, Jesus talks about judging others. This is just good advice. He says, uh, this is one of the most quoted lines in the Bible, right? Judge not lest you be judged. He's saying, look, don't criticize others for the problems in their life if you've got a whole heap of stuff in your own. So what Jesus is saying is good moral teaching. It's helpful. It's healthy. What Jesus said here isn't outlandish. It makes total sense. Your ethical life, your relationships with friends and even strangers, your internal peace will all greatly benefit if you follow Jesus' teaching here, not just listen to it. I mean, he talks about love and worry and the real treasures in life, and generosity. You should read it. You should read it. In fact, I'd encourage you to read Matthew 5 through 7. And if you haven't, uh, put it into practice for one week. For one week, uh, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and do what it says. And see if your peace, if your relationships, if your life is better off. But I got to warn you, don't do it for two weeks or three. Because after about a week, you're going to be so frustrated because it's so hard to do what he said. And that's why, by the way, Jesus isn't saying, oh, I have a new list of rules for you guys to obey. If you do these, you'll be great. He's saying, this is what life looks like God's way, and you're not going to be able to do it alone. You need a better builder than yourself. You need a stronger foundation than you can mine down to. And that's what he's saying he is. Okay, so try it for a week. If you try for two, you're going to be frustrated, okay? Just a warning. Okay, a little rabbit trail. Anyway, this isn't the first time someone had told the Jewish people that, that God wanted their attention and he wanted their obedience. Somebody 600 years before Jesus spoke here had said the same thing. Used a different metaphor for it, but said the same thing. Ezekiel, this man who spoke words from God, he told the people, indeed, to them, God, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. God had been telling his people, you got to do what I say. So both the wise and the foolish man in Jesus' story, they heard the same words. So hearing God's word alone doesn't make you special. It does make you privileged, by the way, because there are over 6,700 people groups in the world that haven't heard what Jesus says, haven't heard about Jesus. They're totally unreached with this news. So it makes you privileged if you hear God's word, but it doesn't make you special, all right? So what will you do with the word you've heard? Jesus, who himself uh, by trade was a contractor, he probably knew a thing or two about houses. He knew an awful lot about foundations and structural integrity. He'd probably seen a house or two collapse because of a weak foundation. And in his parable, both builders are like today. They're, they're Jesus hearers. That would put them in church, right? They heard Jesus. They heard his message. That's kind of like you and me. A Jesus here, maybe, maybe that's someone sitting next to you. Maybe it's you yourself. You've heard what Jesus said. But the difference between the hearer and the doer is one has a foundation and the other doesn't. So let's maybe, let's have fun with this. Let's name the characters in Jesus' story. All right, let's call him Wise Wayne. 
I know it's Bob the Builder. Why is Wayne and foolish Floyd? I mean, Floyd just looks sketchy, right? You can't, you're like, hey, you know. Well, why is Wayne and foolish Floyd? There they are. Um, maybe they were based on real builders in Jesus' community. You know, maybe when Jesus started telling this story, everybody could think of two builders. The one guy that you couldn't trust, you know, no foundation, and then the one guy that you could, did good work. Maybe they had pictures, but maybe they didn't, okay? Maybe this is a clean slate on their conscience. So uh, let's suppose, let's suppose that they're the real builders, Wayne and Floyd. Floyd got twice as many jobs done as Wayne, though, because he didn't do anything below the surface, didn't take any time to do it. People would compare Wayne's homes to Floyd's and hire Floyd because the homes were comparable enough, but Floyd got the work done quicker and cheaper. They just didn't realize that Floyd wasn't excavating below the surface. Who's more popular then? Who's more successful? Who gets invited to more parties, has more friends? Floyd. I mean, he's just reeling in the dough, turning out houses. Wayne's taking his time. He's digging deep, but people don't appreciate it. Thing is, you wouldn't want to spend your fall in one of foolish Floyd's homes, one of his beach cottages, if a hurricane's coming your way. Jesus could be saying to some here, you're fooling everyone else, but you're the fool. You haven't built your life on me. Watch out, get right, he's saying. Dig down through the guilt or laziness or self-righteousness and hit bedrock. It's not going to get washed away. Let me give it to you in trust and grace. Now, by the way, if you're, if you're just kind of checking all this out, if the idea of Jesus or church or the Bible is still stuff you're working through, that's fine. That's fine. In fact, I want to give you permission now to look at the person who invited you or that you came with. If they've said that they're a Christian, if they're a Jesus follower, right now I'm going to give you permission to give them that look that your mom gave you when you were about to do something wrong and you knew it, she knew it. It was like that half scowl, half don't you dare. Okay, you can give them that look right now because they've heard what Jesus said. And if they're not doing it, actually, let's practice now. Let's practice. Just turn to your neighbor, look at them on the left or right, and say, watch it. Practice what you preach. Let's try it. Watch it. Practice what you preach. That's what Jesus was doing here. This was a serious warning. He wasn't just telling stories that they come back for story time the next day, maybe get a free meal this time. He was saying, hello, wake up, watch it. If you don't do my words, you're building a foundationless house and you'll come to ruin. Actually, one of, John, one of Jesus' other followers named John said the same thing. Uh, later after this. He wrote a letter to people and he says, the one who says, I have come to know him, know Jesus, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. The one who says, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, yeah, yeah, but doesn't do it, they're a liar, there's no truth in him. Don't trust that person. Whoa. That means, that means to be repeatedly stirred by God to be in the church, to be in the Bible, to listen to his Holy Spirit, but not obey is to practice rebellion. You will eventually stop feeling, stop hearing, and stop following altogether. Maybe you've often felt tugged at the end of a service, right? Maybe, maybe these days we've got these little tear-offs at the back. Uh, maybe you've been checking boxes week after week and um, putting them in or putting them in your Bible or putting them on your mirror. You're making these commitments, but you, you haven't actually done one of them yet. Maybe during CSI a few weeks ago, something just hit home and connected and you're like, man, I got to do this again. I, I need to talk with that person again or go there or put, put my life out in this way. And you, you meant to, but you haven't done it yet. Maybe God's been putting something on your heart for years. I remember um, when I was a kid, I, would, I wrote these commitments in journals that I had, and I went back over them years later, and I was like, man, I never did like half of those things. I was just practicing disobedience, practicing uh, turning a deaf ear. The things that I knew I was convicted I needed to do. Maybe there's something that God's been putting his finger on for a long time, saying, you know what, you need freedom here. And that's going to come through confession. you got to tell somebody. Maybe it's a giving commitment. You've been holding back. You're like, man, I can't trust in God this way. And God's saying, you know what? Go out. Give. 
I don't know what it is, but I wonder if there's something that God has been convicting you of slowly, kind of like that nagging conscience, and he's saying, do it, do it, do it. Don't shove it back there. Do it, say it, send it, go there, whatever it is. Do the things that God's been telling you. If you hear Jesus say, forgive, love, give grace, think of others, but don't do it, you're probably not going to do it the next time either. You're just rehearsing disobedience. And the result of this practiced lethargy or practiced inaction is disaster for your life. Some people say this is being educated beyond your obedience. And boy, that's probably true of you and I. We've been here week after week, so many of us. We've read the Bible dozens of times. We know what Jesus says. We don't do it. We're educated beyond our obedience. That's Jesus' point. What are you doing with what you know? He's just told them that uh, what life looks like God's way. His hearers could now act accordingly and live, or they could walk away no different to their ruin. Now, notice too, it's not the quality of building above the ground that diminishes its strength. It's the work below the surface that does that. Okay, both builders are capable, their houses look great. It's not their work ethic or their excellence or their final product above the surface that makes one a winner and one a loser. The foolish man's house would have stood great if it were on a good foundation. So it makes me ask, why did the foolish builder build on sand? Right? Now, Jesus is telling a story, and, and his, his main point is a little beyond this, but I have to pause and ask, why would the foolish man build his house on sand? Right? Well, maybe it was because that's all he could afford. He didn't have the money to dig down deep 30 feet into bedrock. Just, he just couldn't do it. Or maybe, like me, he was a cheapskate. He had the money, but he didn't want to spend it. Maybe he was burned. I know I've been burned by buying something junky and cheap, and it breaks, and you have to buy it again. This time, the, the one you should have bought the first. So maybe, maybe it was cheap, or maybe he didn't have the funds. I don't know. Maybe he liked the scenery better in the one location. Maybe he had a little bit more shade or a little bit more sun. He kind of, you know, he visited, and it was cozy. Maybe he went there during the summer, you know, when it was dry, and thought, oh, this is the spot. This is where I'm going to go. And then maybe, maybe some neighbors down the road said, hey, you know, uh, when the fall and winter come, it rains, and uh, that's like a floodplain. And he was like, no, nah, it'll be fine. Be fine. So he built there anyway. Can I tell you, you probably know this already, what we say, it'll be fine about, it's often not fine. Like, major problems happen when we say, oh, it'll be fine, right? Yeah. Um, or maybe the guy didn't know better, you know? I just, maybe he was like, this was his first house that he ever built. He didn't know, he didn't go to trade school. But that's not, Jesus is saying he was a fool. Like, he knew what he should do, and he thought, nah, oh, it'll be fine. And he did otherwise. So he was a fool. It wasn't ignorance. He couldn't claim ignorance. You know, I'm thinking more... Maybe it was like, maybe it was autumn, uh, and there hadn't been any rain. Maybe it was just like a particularly miraculous, dry fall and winter, uh, uncommon for that, that climate. And let's say it happened again the next year. Another good, not so rainy, no floods. What if it happened again and again, like year after year? Let's say 10 years, the, the typically dry flooding season wasn't dry and flooding. And so this guy, this dude built his house, no flood has, has tackled it yet. And he's thinking, I showed them. See, I told you it'd be fine, right? Come on, guys, it's fine. You should build next door. There's plenty of room. See, we do that too. Like, we do it the first time. We do something that we know we shouldn't do, or, and we don't get caught. So we're like, sweet. So we do it again. Didn't get caught. Man, nobody saw. Can you believe it? Nobody saw. So you do it again and again, you're like, Man, I have everybody fooled. This is great. My life is fine. Everybody was warning me, don't do that. What do they know? It's fine. And then maybe, maybe you go a little bit too far the next time, or maybe you do the same thing you've been doing. You've been thinking the same thing, acting the same way, but this time you get caught and everything falls apart. It doesn't matter how many, how many easy seasons you had. Man, your house comes crashing down. I wonder if that was the foolish builder. If, his, if he said, no, nah, I've built them this way for years. They're fine. Man, it just took one bad storm, wiped them out. You know, it's interesting that 
Jesus says the wise man found that a life built on God's words would not prevent storms, but it would endure them. So I want to encourage you. Uh, what Jesus is saying about the storm, by the way, I'll talk about it in a moment. It's not just the trials of life. Okay, it's something way bigger, and I'll comment in a minute. But for those of you that are facing storms, like difficult days in your life, I want to encourage you. Uh, actually, let, let the Word of God encourage you. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. They used to seal their foundations. The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. I want to encourage you, if you have built your life on Jesus Christ and still, man, storms are crashing in on your life and it feels like everything's falling apart, God knows you, you're his. And he says, if you keep turning away from wickedness, if you keep following me, I got you. So build your life on Christ, stand with him, do the right thing and honor God. He's got you. After Jesus told this little story, the crowd was amazed. Look at verses 28 and 29. They didn't know what to do with these words that they heard. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. The word for amazed here, for their reaction, it means beside themselves in astonishment. They're thunderstruck. Okay, it wasn't, wasn't some, some little like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It was like, what? What did he just say? No way. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. So if, wait, how, who, who is this man? They were left totally astonished at what Jesus was saying. Why? <laughs> well, compare Jesus' teaching, his words, even his style, to the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees, the religious rulers of that day, they quoted other people to gain authority for themselves, kind of like academic name-dropping. Jesus, he quoted Scripture. The scribes, the Pharisees, they taught with self-righteous condescension to their lowly listeners, the so-called sinners, the unclean. But Jesus taught with love for his humble listeners, and he rebuked those who were self-righteous. The scribes, the Pharisees, they believed that even, uh, they had this theological uh, uh, hypothetical situation in their mind that even if God gave the law that he gave to the Jews to the Gentiles, they wouldn't be able to obey it. They would try, they'd fail, and God would laugh at them. That was their idea of Gentiles and their capability of obedience. Jesus, on the other hand, taught that anyone from any nation could obey God and be welcomed into God's kingdom. The scribes and the Pharisees, they just gave condemnation freely. Jesus gave mercy freely. So Jesus isn't just interpreting Scripture like the religious leaders. He's claiming authority. He's teaching from his own notes. Yeah, he stood on Scripture. He quoted it tons of times in his teaching. But he was teaching it in a way that, that was like he was God. He was using that kind of authority. And he backed it up, by the way, with the things he did. No one else was giving sight to the blind or, or uh, hearing to the deaf or bringing dead people back to life. Jesus was getting attention. In a culture of deep reverence for the Word of God, where they would inscribe it on their buildings, they would sew it onto their garments, Jesus was speaking the Word of God. And they knew he was trying to do that. This authority amazed them. It shocked them. How audacious. William Barclay, one of the commenters about this passage, said, Jesus is saying that unless someone takes Jesus as his master, they cannot look for anything else but the ruin of their life. Wow. That's a big ultimatum. Now, Matthew, the writer of the story we're looking at, he himself believed that this authority claim about Jesus. I mean, he, he had either seen himself or, or interviewed witnesses who saw Jesus dead and then alive again, and powerfully alive, alive in a different kind of way. He wasn't just resuscitated, like he's not dying again, kind of alive again. And so Matthew was saying, hey, this man claimed to be God, and I believe him. Another guy who followed Jesus believed the same thing. This time it was his own brother, or half-brother. James grew up in Jesus' household, saw him, was kind of probably skeptical at first, but then Man, when that guy walked out of the grave, James believed. In fact, James writes this, the same thing as what Jesus is saying. He says in chapter 1, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, 
and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Here's the scariest part of Jesus' story, of his teaching here. The scariest part is that the storm he's referring to is not just a trial of life. It's not a difficult time. It's not a job loss. It's not a cancer diagnosis. It's the judgment of God, of every human being on earth, ever. Jesus teaches that after we die, our lives on earth are finished, and we must give an account of our life to God. We must answer for every word, every thought, every action we did, as well as those we didn't do but could have. This is the sum total of your life and mine. When we stand before the one who gave us breath and gave us our bodies, and we answer for it all. The standard he measures us against, though, is not our own. It's him. Especially the one, the perfect, never-failing God who became a man, was tested in all the ways we were, yet didn't cave in, who overcame instead. That's the standard we're measured against. So we're hopeless. I mean, our our lives, man, we're in ruins. We can try to go on and on about all the things we did, but that's like hanging a crystal chandelier in a beach house that's about about to face a Category 5 hurricane. It's just going to end up in a pile of rubble at the end. Jesus is inviting his hearers, which is now you too, to build your life on him and nothing else. My dad is a structural engineer. And he gets frequent calls from homeowners or prospective home buyers to inspect foundations. Typically, they'll see some cracks in the foundation in the basement wall. They'll call them up, and, and their fear is that the foundation will be so bad that uh, either they'll need to spend tons of money or, or just not buy the house at all. And my dad said, had told me this week, um, when that's the case, when there's big cracks in the foundation, that means that the soil underneath is soft and the house is settling. The house won't stop settling. The cracks will just get worse and worse. It costs tons of money to repair that kind of cracked foundation on soft soil. So his advice to someone buying a house where that's the case is don't buy it. Or if you do, level it and start a new foundation. Because it's going to cost you tons of money. You're never going to catch up. You can't just paint the wall and say, hey, it's fine. We're all good. No more cracks. They're going to get worse. Your house is sinking into soft soil to that ruin. You could hear... Jesus' words in two ways today. You could take it as good news or bad news. You really could. Um, I guess let me sort of strangely encourage some of you to take it as good news. If you're not sure about the whole Jesus thing, if, if the, the verdict's still out on is the Bible true, what is church doing, um, if you're not interested in obeying Jesus and you haven't told, uh, decided to follow him yet, this could actually be good news for you. Because Jesus is saying, look, both houses were fine above the surface. That means you could build a life that's nice. You could have happiness. You could do the things you want to do without obeying Jesus, without even giving a thought to him. You could do that, and your life will probably be fine temporarily until one day. And that's where the good news changes to bad news. Because you could be building your life, and it seems just fine. But one day, your life will be accounted for. And that day could be your great collapse. Jesus is not saying, hey, do some more stuff. It'll make your life better. He's saying, you need a new foundation. In fact, that's why Jesus used language when he was talking to people. One time this guy came to him and said, Jesus, how do I get into your kingdom? Talking about your kingdom. I want in. Tell me how. Jesus says, well, you got to be born again. The guy's like, what? Jesus said stuff like that. He said to other people, like, you have to die to yourself. They knew what crosses were. He said, you have to take up your cross, your instrument of death. You're going to have to die to yourself. He's telling people it's so hard to undermine a house that's already sinking and try to patch it back together and keep it standing and present it on that last judgment day. He's saying, you know what? Scrap it and start over. Put a new foundation, a good foundation, and let me be the foundation. And then you're not going to build very well. Let me be the builder of your home. Trust me. Let me build you in grace, and I'll, I'll help you do the things I'm saying, but you can't do them on your own. So that's the good news, or the bad news, I guess, depending on your perspective. There was a man uh, back in the 1800s named Edward Mote. He was a carpenter himself. He was a cabinet maker. 
Didn't grow up in a Jesus-knowing or loving home, had no idea. He actually wrote in his journal that he didn't even know there was a God. The idea of God was totally foreign to him. Um, But when he was 18, somebody shared the message of Jesus with him, showed him the Bible, and he decided, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus. His life was changed. At 18, he was baptized. Um, But he had been apprenticing to become a cabinet maker. So for the next 37 years of his life, he built cabinets. One day, on his way to work, this this little line popped in his head, and he's like, I'm going to write a song. So he he started with this little chorus, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all the ground is sinking sand. And he kept walking, and before he even got to the shop, he had two verses written in his head, and at the end of the work day, after making cabinets, he had written this whole song that we now sing and call the solid rock, well-known hymn of the church. Just a normal guy, blown away by the foundation of Christ, by the impact it had on his life, and on the hope he had looking forward to building his life on that foundation. I want to invite you, uh, as we actually sing that song together now, to reflect on Jesus' words. Decide to do what you hear. In fact, if you, if you do want to uh, take one of these tear-offs in the bulletin, I'm going to act on that prompting I've been sensing. If God has been saying something to you for years, for a day, for an hour, do it. Make a commitment to do it. Or, or maybe you're still checking things out. Uh, I'd challenge you to, to learn what life looks like lived God's way. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Or today might be the day you're like, you know what? My life is this. I, I got nothing to stand on. I want to build my life on the foundation of Christ. And maybe you make that decision. Whatever it is, um, hear from God and do what he says.